And welcome to Weather Geeks. I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard from the University of Georgia, and we have an amazing show today. I, some of the coolest imagery I think we've ever sh shown on the show. You just have to stick around and see it. But we have Lee Orff, Associate Scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies. But we're not talking satellites today, we're talking models. Uh, Lee uses some of the most advanced computer models to model storms, tornadoes, and we're going to show you some of that. It's amazing. But tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into what you're doing. Sure. Um, well, first, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I got interested into weather very early. Uh, my house was hit by lightning sure. when I was young. And then uh, on October 3rd, 1979, the Windsor Lock tornado went up the Connecticut River Valley, destroyed a bunch of vintage airplanes, and died right about over my house. Oh, wow. Um, so this was, uh, weather was sort of first and foremost early on in my life. And uh, I've always been interested in the weather, in science in general, and computing, but that's what sort of got me on the weather kick right away. Yeah, and we were talking, and you were talking about you've been as interested in weather as you were in what we call high-performance computing. So you've married the two, and we're going to talk now about this modeling system that you use to model tornadic storms and produce some of the most amazing output I've ever seen. But you've modeled, for example, a specific tornado, the El Reno 2011 tornado, significant tornado. Tell us why that storm and what you found? Sure. Well, we didn't exactly model that specific storm. I want to be clear, but what we did was we grew a, we grew a cloud in the environment that was similar to that storm. Absolutely. So um, we were trying different things. We had access to the Blue Waters computer. I had most of my graphics code Let working. me stop you right there and then we'll pick up. The sure. Blue Waters computer is a supercomputer and it's found at the uh, University of Illinois at the National Supercomputing Center. National Center for Supercomputing yeah. Applications, Absolutely. NCSA. Yeah, now pick up your story. Okay, so we had access to the machine. We had most of our code working, but we didn't have our storm yet. Okay. So we tried different, uh, different events. We tried some analytical soundings, which are sort of like a smooth sort of average type uh, soundings. Uh, profiles of the atmosphere, but we landed on 24 May 2011, and in, immediately I started to simulate this at, at, at coarse resolutions, and it looked like some in interesting things were happening. So right when we were just running out of supercomputing time, we were literally about ready to get kick kicked off the machine, I, I tried another thing, <laughs> another simulation, and I come home, and I'm looking at the results coming in, and I see this thin blue line starting to move across the screen, which was the pressure drop inside the tornado. Right. And I looked a little closer, and I said, wow, that's an EF5. So right. that was pretty exciting. Right. So you really were sort of learning on the fly here. Did, Absolutely. Did you know you were going to sort of be modeling these types of systems when you sort of brought your love of meteorology and computing together? Because, um, you know, there's yeah. modeling at different scales. There's everything from global models to, to the scale that you're looking at. I mean, how did you kind of end up converging, sure. pun intended, on this scale? Sure. Well, um, when I was a student at the University of Wisconsin, uh, one of my professors was John Anderson, and he was turned out to be my, my PhD advisor. And he was focused. He was a very interesting guy. He ended up working for Pixar and Industrial Light and Magic and doing all sorts of graphical stuff, which sort of, some of it rubbed off on me, apparently. Um, but he was interested in, in, in thunderstorms and things like that. And he uh, was interested in downbursts, okay? So back in the late 90s or so, uh, downbursts were still of concern because they can cause planes to fall out of the sky because correct. of the wind shear. Tell us a little, th th 20 seconds on what downbursts are. So downburst is a really intense downdraft that forms inside of th thunderstorms under certain conditions that can cause winds that are very, very strong, but they're straight line winds, right. but you don't want to fly a plane through them. That's correct. And you know, it's interesting. I, I wrote a column on this recently because with some of our advances in radar technology, downbursts, microbursts, we've seen a reduction in air, uh, airline disasters because of that phenomenon. Absolutely. I, I rem I'm old enough to remember when that was a real big problem. Absolutely. Yeah. I always feel very confident now flying. I, I mean, th that's one thing that you won't encounter now because we've got terminal Doppler weather radars at the airports and the, p the pilots are trained to understand where to avoid. So you just don't see many any wind shear uh, hazards, uh, wind shear aircraft hazards or, or, or accidents. Anyway. I want to I want to get back to your modeling sure. now because the computers and the type of computing you're doing, it's really big time stuff. You're using the CM1 model. That's right. And I have some specs here that says you're running on 1.84 billion grid points That's and again right. uh, our producer Matt uh, Sitkowski knows I'm going to say this because our viewers need to understand that grid points we think about a digital camera you have megapixels the more sure. megapixels you have the better the resolution of the, That's uh, right. the picture so talk about that from a modeling standpoint with all these grid points sure absolutely so it's a, it's a, it's an analogy to what you just said with the two dimensional megapixels in my case we have three dimensions because sure. we're trying to do the the upward part of the storm as well so instead of pixels you have cubes essentially grid cubes and those cubes are 30 meters on a side. 
And the thing about doing this high resolution modeling work is if you double the resolution, like let's say we now want to go to 15 meters, it takes 16 times more computational resources. Right. So it's a real steep curve and you need this, this, uh, these supercomputing hardware to do this kind of work. Right, and you know, what he's talking about, you know, he, he's running his model about 30 meter resolution, right. right? which means that it can resolve something in the atmosphere that's a roughly at about a 30 meter scale at a minimum. Uh, right. Think about some of our other models, one kilometer, four kilometer, uh, for some of the other models we use at the mesoscale. So again, if we want to resolve some of these fine scale features in a tornadic storm, you've got to have that kind of resolution, is you that right? You really do. Um, if you look at like our forecast models for like forecasting the next 24 hours or something, um, you know, a, a thunderstorm will show up, but you won't be able to resolve a tornado even if it occurs. Exactly. Kind of gets washed out. It gets washed it's just out. Too coarse. Right. Um, now, what is the now the wow factor on this is off the charts when you see this after the commercial. But what is the scientific research goal that you have yes. in mind? We currently really don't know why some supercells produce devastating long track wedge tornadoes that are just awful and, and, and very destructive and some don't produce tornadoes at all or maybe right. very weak tornadoes. Right. And that's the main question we're trying to figure out is what, what set of conditions is, is in the storm or in the environment that leads to these super high end uh, events because they're the ones that cause the most damage and the most fatalities. Right. And again, if I sound like a broken record, it's because I'm a weather geek and I'm excited to show you some of these results coming up after the break. And 20 seconds or less, what do you need to improve your model even more? Well, uh, we need to handle the surface of the earth a little bit better. At some point, we need to start putting trees and buildings in there because that's what happens in the real earth. We need uh, better supercomputers that can do more grid pixels right. and, uh, and more observations so we can uh, make our models more accurate to the real atmosphere. And I'm about to jump out of my seat, and I literally am going to get out of my seat because in this next segment, we're going to look at the amazing power of these models and what they can do to show you what happens in a tornadic storm. Next on Weather Geeks, but first our Geek of the Week. This week's Geek of the Week is National Weather Service Twin Cities meteorologist Jacob Beidlich. Jacob grew up on a farm and was constantly checking to see when it would rain next. He has boatloads of favorite weather events, including ground blizzards, something he forecasts often in the upper Midwest. And when he's not watching the weather, he's often sharing his passion with the students at St. Paul College or just gardening with his family in the backyard. Congratulations to Jacob Bidlick, our Geek of the Week! What makes me a weather geek? The fact that I love the weather, especially when it's, when it's hit me on the side of the face. I'm going to ride this one out, guys. Be one of the thousands of weather geeks out there at weloveweather.tv. And we are back on Weather Geeks, and I, I don't know if you could see it in the first block, but I've been excited to talk about this next segment. We've got Lee Orff here from uh, Sims. What are we seeing here, and let's talk about it. Sure, so this is a still image from one of the uh, videos I made. Um, this is the cloud, okay? So we're actually showing the cloud field of a simulated supercell. Yeah. There is your tornado, there it is on the ground. Uh, this is the lower part of the mesocyclone, the upper part of the mesocyclone, and you see the anvil of the cloud, you can see it back here, you can see mammatus type cloud features up in the storm. And I wanted it to talk good. about that because a mesocyclone is a rotating updraft, right. and oftentimes people see these weird clouds called mammatus, and you're capturing that. I think we're going to actually now put some of this in motion and look at some of the video here sure. so and we're talk through what we're seeing From here. the top, here's the overshooting top of the storm, we're just kind of rotating it, there it is into the stratosphere, there's the lovely mammatus clouds, and there's the tornado. Uh, cloud and then you can put it into motion so it's about 60 times real time so it's spun up really fast but you can see uh, the explosive growth of the updraft plumes in the, in the updraft of the storm. You can see uh, a flanking line over here of the storm, not much going on there. The tornado's just churning away. Tornado's there. And yep. keep in mind, we're moving with the storm, okay? Right. So the storm isn't actually sitting in one place, we're moving with it. That is correct. And you can even see another storm in the background that's sort of kicking off there. But this, when I look at this, it makes me think we're doing something right because it looks a lot like a real storm. And you can actually detect and capture vorticity in your model as well. And yes. so we're gonna talk about vorticity here as well. And, to, and, and Sure. As you're talking about this, make sure you're talking about the negative and positive vortices sure. because you're capturing both Absolutely. and that's important. So this is prior to a tornado formation. This is the full three-dimensional vorticity field, but I'm shading it by the vertical component. What that means is the red guys are rotating anti or cyclonically like we expect for a tornado to move. The blue guys are rotating anticyclonically or clockwise, right. which we don't see a lot of anticyclonic tornadoes in, in Mother Nature. 
Um, but here you can see horizontal vorticity is being tilted into the vertical, and that's really what this, this shows. It also shows a lot of small sort of mini tornadoes, you call them mesocyclones, that are sort of coming in together to feed this. Now we have a tornado here. There's the tornado um, there it right is. here. It, 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 it happened really fast, right. and, and, and that's another, these, these movies, we do this because we're trying to get a feel for what's going on in these storms. There's so much data, hundreds of terabytes of data in these storms. So I make these movies in order to sort of get a, a survey of the storm before we start to go in and quantitatively try to analyze it. But you can, the, the video tells the story pretty well. Right, you're seeing, you're capturing, and I want to kind of talk as, as it starts over again, I want right. to talk about this process by which the tornado, you talk about this vorticity right. and sort of this inflow region. Talk to us a little bit about that vorticity and the stretching here, because Absolutely. I think people may not be familiar with sure. that. Sure, so there's different ways that you can grow spin. Vorticity is sort of a measure of spin. Um, you can stretch it like a, a, a conserving angular momentum, like so a, a, ice skater. a ice skater sure. pulling in her arms. Uh, you can also tilt it, which is just reorienting it. And what you're seeing here is vorticity along this boundary in the forward flank of the storm, which is horizontally oriented, right. is being sort of sucked into the updraft and becoming erect, and that is contributing towards the mesocyclone because it's a vertical vortex, or yeah. a giant vertical vortex. And we're gonna, we want to get to this next video because we have about a minute left. So we're going to go to the next video and tell us about this. This, was, this really yeah. just blew me this away is, when I saw this. This is the highest resolution simulation I've ever done. It's 20 meters. This makes the most realistic looking tornado I've ever made before. You're starting to capture the suction vortices within the tornado. You yeah, see little, multiple, little mini multiple suctions. You yeah. can see little breaks. You can see right through this sometimes, or you can see in between the cloud, in, uh, watching the individual vortices. So this is another, uh, uh, I guess, a validation that we're doing something right. There you go, you can sort of capture those. There you those. see those. And those are really sometimes when you see those sporadic damage patterns in neighborhoods, those, it's these little suction vortices. That's what we think. Right. And, and we've seen them in nature. We've seen them with, uh, with, dual, with Doppler radars. Uh, here is uh, the formation of a tornado. You can focus here. This guy right here is going to become the tornado, and you can watch it structure change. I've got to stop you. We just don't have the time. We've got to have <laughs> you back to talk more about this. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the future. Where is all of this going next on Weather Geeks? <laughs> and we're back on Weather Geeks, and I'm talking to Lee Orff. And I mean, I'm still catching my breath from some of that amazing uh, visualization that we it's just cool. saw. Uh, and so the obvious next question for me is, where do you go next with this? Right. We've got so much data to sift through. So we're going to be focusing on this particular simulation for quite a while, but we're already looking at the next simulations. We're going to try to simulate other environments. So we're looking at like Greensburg, Kansas, Tuscaloosa, the big outbreaks in 2011, maybe even Joplin, Missouri. Right. Those are the types of storms we'd like to try to, you know, model those storms pretty faithfully so we can figure out what went, what went wrong and you know it, or what happened um, but in general I think in order to sort of take this to the next level we need more we need faster supercomputers with more memory um, this brings us into the exascale part of what we're calling exascale the current supercomputers are petascale it's going to be a real challenge to you have just so much data and it becomes a real data problem it's just a big data problem it really you is heard the buzzword and it's big data now but modelers like yourself have been dealing with big data for decades i've spent more time working with the data problem than i have working with the tornado problem right. honestly i spent uh you know about a decade just sort of thinking about how to do this and testing things out on different supercomputers seeing what worked well and finding ways to get the data from the in, from the computer's memory to the hard drive in a in a way that i could actually use it uh easily after the fact and also so it's really fast when you write the and data. And a little Weather Geeks, uh, Weather Geeks tidbit for you, uh, you may not realize that the first ever computer, ENIAC, many of its first functions were on weather modeling. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, they're, they're weathers and weather modeling computers are intimately tied and you're hearing it today. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these types of uh, systems, fluid dynamics, uh, cosmology, etc., they're all sort of solving the future state of things, and, and, you, and you need really powerful computers. Right, yeah, I mean, and, and what we just looked at in that last segment, you're really seeing fluid flow at a very fine scale, and it looked like you're doing pretty good, but w in terms of physical processes, do, do we need to better represent frictional processes, yeah. moisture processes? I mean, what's sort of your holy grail to sure. really take it to the next? I would love to put trees and houses in this yeah, model. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, right. I mean, we're getting to the point where the resolution is going to be high enough that we're almost going to have to do that in right. order to capture the surface right. So we, so we can certainly uh, improve our treatment of the surface. We can improve the way that we handle clouds and precipitation. That's always a tough one because real clouds have real hailstones and tons of raindrops and we don't. We, I mean, our models have a representation of how much stuff is in each grid volume, but not it's not falling like a real raindrop. 
Um, there's also, we need better observations. You know, we need, we need better, stronger satellites to capture the real atmosphere better so that we can make our models better. Yeah, and we, you know, in a time where there's talk of cuts to satellite systems, we certainly know that satellites benefit us for sort of a now casting standpoint, but also models and also research. So Absolutely. we definitely want to get that in because this is uncertain times. We need those satellites and we need the continuous satellite record. I, I, I agree it completely. Yeah, uh, and so I know you can, I can say that, you don't have to say it. Uh, is there a location where people can go and look at these simulations? Sure, I, I post all my talks and such online, uh, orf.media is okay. the website real easy to, to go to. You can go there and I, I put all my, my talks and you can look at these videos for almost hours and hours. And we've been talking about tornadoes, but in the last minute or so, can this be applied to things like derechos Absolutely. or hurricane environments that sure. spin up tornadoes? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, there's some very good work being done at very high resolution uh, hurricane modeling. Um, and you can certainly, if you can get the computing power and get the model and get the initial conditions right, you can do amazing things with these models. One last question. Is something like this ever going to be operational? Will it be in an AWIPS in a National Weather Service office one day? Or what do you see that happening? I would like to see us get to the point where the simulation I just showed you is one of a series in an ensemble. So we have like dozens of those simulations going ahead of time, catch, before the storm occurs, giving us a probabilistic spread of what we might expect. I hope to see that in the next 20, 30 years. And I, I think we will. I think as long as we get the computing capabilities, that's where we have to end it. Thank you very much for joining us, Lee. Thank you. Don't forget, we're here every Sunday on the Weather Channel at noon, and we can also be found on Twitter at WXGeeksTWC, and we have a Facebook page. We'll see you next week on Weather Geeks.